here's what I want to talk about today. In the coming year, I, I really want to be committed to and focused around uh, four ideas. And these um, four ideas, we had four ideas last year, but these are a little bit different. But I feel like this is where the Lord uh, is leading us in this season <coughs> of our church. And so I believe this year he's calling us as a body to pray, love, give, go on your uh, handout this morning, you can find those in the middle of the page, pray, love, give, go. And so every week um, or every couple weeks, we'll try to give you <coughs> some opportunities here where you can pray, where you can love, where you can give, and you can go. Uh, in the next few weeks, I want to take some time to try to build out what these are going to look like for us in the coming year. And today... I want us to talk about prayer. What a fitting time to talk about prayer. And so uh, before we talk about prayer, I believe that we need to pray. And so uh, let's take a few moments and pray right now. Um, Heavenly Father, we, we just come to you this morning, God. We thank you that your Spirit's already working in this place, Father, that you've already uh, ministered to hearts, God, that you've already done a work in us this morning. And um, God, as we begin to talk about prayer this morning, Lord, I, I just pray that you'd do something special in our hearts, God. Lord, I pray that when we leave this place today, Lord, that we wouldn't see prayer as an obligation. Lord, that we wouldn't see prayer as a, a, as a, a have to or something to check off of a, a to-do list every week. But God, that we would see prayer as a privilege, Father, that we could see prayer as a as an opportunity that we have, not an obligation, but an opportunity, God. Lord, that we could see, God, just a glimpse of your glory this morning, Father, so that we could understand what a privilege it is to get to talk to you, God. Lord, we thank you for that opportunity. Lord, we know that that hasn't been available to everyone for all time. And so, God, we thank you that you've looked at us and had mercy. And you've said, you can come to me anytime, Father. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to talk to you, God. And I, I pray, Father, that this morning, God, that you just prioritize that in our hearts. God, help us to, to love to talk to you, Father. Grow our affections for you. Father, just do something in us today, Father, where we long for a moment to speak to our Heavenly Father. Lord, move in this place. Change our hearts. God, we can't do anything without you. God, I can't do this without you. We need you today, God. We're seeking you today, God. We're drawing near to you, God. And we thank you in your word. You promise that when we draw near to you, God, that you'll draw near to us, that when we seek you, we'll find you. Lord, we thank you this morning. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm fully persuaded this morning that the most important thing that the church could do is to pray. I believe that the most important thing that we could do as a church is to be a Pray in church. I believe that the most important way that you could serve this church is to be a praying church member. I believe that the most important aspect of our Christian life is our prayer life. <coughs> prayer is one of the most underestimated underused and undervalued parts of the Christian life. <clears throat> Today I'm going to argue that the whole Christian life is built around this idea of prayer, the idea of being able to be connected to God. And what burdens me so much is that many Christians, I would even say most Christians today, see Prayer is an obligation or a duty. We see prayer as a last resort. Have you ever felt that way? That prayer is the last resort. I, I felt like that in my life. All we can do now is pray. Have you ever said that? All we can do now is pray. 
Some people pray when they're in trouble. Some people pray when they're sick or their their family member's sick or when their sports team is down in the end of the game. But but rarely do we have a, a, a pattern, a lifestyle of prayer. Man, how much more powerful could the church be if we were committed to pray? Many people see the that prayer is a last ditch effort. That's why the the one of the last plays of the football game, uh, where everybody runs and you just throw something out there, is called a hail mary because it's the last resort. Of course, we don't pray to Mary, but it's the same idea that it's just a, a hope and a prayer you kind of throw out there at the end, and that's how most of us pray. It's just uh, when you've tried everything you could try, when you've done everything you could do, and you, uh, there's nothing else you could possibly try, well, I guess I'll try to pray. Man, that's not the way that we should see prayer. Could it be that, that all we needed to do was pray from the very beginning? If we say all we can do now is pray, maybe that's where we should have started. Maybe we could have saved ourselves a lot of heartbreak, a lot of effort, a lot of frustration if we had started at prayer instead of finish there. Today I believe that prayer is a privilege. Prayer is a privilege. And that's the title of my sermon this morning, The Privilege of Prayer. If you have your Bible this morning turned over to Hebrews chapter 4, I want to show you something there. Hebrews chapter 4. I want to give you some context surrounding this, uh, this verse this morning, this chapter, this book. We don't really know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, some people say Paul, some people... Uh, say Luke, some people say other people, but that doesn't really matter. What we do know about this book is that it's been inspired by the Spirit of God, that it's uh, trustworthy and that we can build our lives around it. And so uh, we do know that, that the book of Hebrews was written to believers in Rome. Um, the church at Rome had uh, been established on the day of Pentecost, if you remember um, when the Spirit of God came down and the apostles began to preach um, in Jerusalem, there was Jews there from every nation around the world, and um, one of those nations was Rome. And so, um, when those Jewish, when those people became believers, those Jewish first Jewish believers went back to Rome. Uh, they established a church there, and uh, that church was facing quite a bit of persecution. Um, they were facing persecution not only from the Jews that didn't believe in Jesus, but they also faced persecution from the Romans uh, because they didn't believe in the Roman gods. <coughs> and so they were kind of pressured on all sides, and some of them had begun to give up. Some of them had begun to turn back, to go back to the old ways of living, to go back to the, to the law or, or wherever they had come out of. And so... Uh, the author of Hebrews writes to encourage these Jewish believers in Rome that they wouldn't give up to remind them of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so uh, that's kind of the, the idea of the book of Romans. And we find ourselves at the end of chapter 4. And the author has been talking about um, the fact that all of these years God had intended for his people to enter a kind of rest. Uh, um, and, and Moses couldn't provide it, and Joshua couldn't provide it, and none of the other kings could provide it. But in Jesus, we've been able to enter a rest. And so we want to pick up at um, Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 11. And we're going to read all the way to the end of the chapter. And so uh, it says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature 
is hidden from his sight, but we are all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Don't give up. Hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, here's our verse today, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Amen. Um, I, I feel like this morning that many of us, as we read that last verse, uh, that we can um, come, we can draw near to the throne of grace with confidence, or the old uh, King James says, come boldly before his throne. Um, I, I feel like many of us are encouraged by that verse, but it, it doesn't take our breath like I believe that it should. I, I think that many of us have heard so many sermons and, and sat through so many Sunday school lessons that that we have uh, lost some perspective about this verse. And so what this verse means is that we can come into God's presence, to come into God's presence boldly with confidence. And so I I think that we need to go back a little before we can see this with clear vision before we get a good perspective on this verse and so um, think about it this way any of the Old Testament heroes any one of them that you could think of Abraham, Moses, Noah, David any one of them (coughs) would have been flabbergasted by this verse because in the Old Covenant you didn't come into God's presence confidently you didn't come into God's presence with boldness you came in to God's presence hoping that you'd be able to walk back out you you didn't walk into God's presence boldly you walked into God's presence with fear and trembling for example in Exodus 19 you don't have to turn there I'm going to tell you the story you can read it this week on your own we, we find a, a meeting between uh, Moses and God, and God says, I'm going to come down on the mountain and I'm going to meet the people of Israel. And so he gives Moses very specific instructions. He says, I want you to go into the camp and I want you to consecrate the people. I want you to prepare, and on the third day, I'm going to come down onto the mountain. And here's the deal. If anyone touches the mountain, they will die. Not if they walk up the mountain, if they lay a finger on the mountain, they'll die. Now think about that. God is going to be on the top of this great mountain, way up there at the top. And if I as much as touch the bottom of the base, I'll die. Think about the kind of glory and wonder that must be God's presence. If you touch the mountain God's standing on, you'll die. On the third day, God comes down on the mountain, and it says that it was uh, pillars of smoke, that God was in the, the smoke, and when God spoke, it was like loud, ear-deafening thunder. That when God spoke, it was just... It would just shake you. Think about God's presence. That that when he come down on the mountain and when he said something, it was like thunder shaking you. Have you ever been shook by thunder? It was so close that it just rocked you. That's how the people felt in the valley when God was on the mountain. Think about the, the glory of God's presence. Later in the, in the tabernacle and then later on even more in the temple, 
uh, we find the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was instructed, uh, it was constructed in a certain way um, that God told the people of Israel to uh, construct it. And it was where the glory of God on planet earth would sit. It was where God's presence would be. <coughs> and so it was surrounded by uh, other courts and other um, it was surrounded by tents and then later other courts. And it was in the innermost place of the tabernacle or the temple. It was kind of the same deal, either one. But no one could go into the Ark of the Covenant except a high priest one time a year. On the Day of Atonement, they could go in after they had um, made sacrifices for their own sin, after they had uh, dressed just perfectly after they had got all their ducks in the row, then they could walk in to the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was and God's presence dwelled. But here's the catch. They tied a rope around the, the waist of the high priest because if he had any sin in his life, if he didn't have his garments on right, when he walked into the presence of God, he would die and they'd have to drag his body out. Now think about that. The presence of God is a powerful place. It's a, a glorious place. It should fill us with wonder and awe. I, I feel like we've missed the, the idea of God's presence. We think God's presence is just a, 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 a chill bump up and down our spine every now and then when the singing gets good. But it's, it's more than that. When we get to come into God's presence, it's a, a powerful place to be. We, we see these examples in the Old Testament that it was such a powerful place that if you, if you came in, you'd have to come in fear and you'd come in dread. Could you imagine having to be the high priest and walking in right at the edge of the door where you'd walk in and you're just thinking, I, I hope that I, I made sacrifice for all my sin. I hope that I, I got all my, uh, my, my pants on right. And I hope I got my robe on right. Because if I don't, when I walk in, I, I'm going to be dead. Could you imagine the fear and dread that must have been? But yet the author of Hebrews says that we get to come into his presence, into his throne room confidently. The same God who, who was on top of the mountain in the pillars of smoke. The same God who spoke with thunder. The same God who sat on the Ark of the Covenant. The same God who parted the Red Seas. The same God who dropped the giant. The same God who done all these things. We get to come into His presence. What a privilege. What a privilege to get to come into God's presence. Do you know that the Old Testament heroes would have been beside themselves to get 24-7 access to the presence of God? They would have been beside themselves. What do you think David would have done if you had told him you can come into God's presence anytime you want? You, you can, you can uh, be in God's presence no matter where you are or, or, or what you're doing. You can call on the name of the Lord and He'll hear you. They would have said, you mean to tell me that I get to come into God's presence whenever I want to, that I can come with confidence into God's presence? You're joking me. You've got to be kidding me. What a privilege we have. I want you to understand that this morning, that, that prayer is not an obligation, that prayer is not something to check off your religious to-do list. Prayer is a, a privilege, the greatest privilege that human beings have ever been given is to get to talk to a holy God. None of us are worthy to talk to God. None of us are worthy to talk to God, and yet God invites you and I into His presence. And He says, come confidently in to the throne room. <coughs> what an amazing privilege. 
It's an opportunity of a lifetime every day. Imagine with me for a moment that if there was an extremely wealthy man who was passing through and he, he came to our church and he stood up on the stage this morning and he said, I, I just want you to know um, that I've decided to be generous with all my money and I've brought some cashier's checks with me this morning and uh, I, have a hunt, I have a million dollars in on cashier checks, and all you have to do is go to the foyer and pick it up. I have one for everybody here. Just go on back and get your cashier's check. We would beat each other to death trying to get to the back, wouldn't we? They'd be fights. They'd be hair pulling. They'd be people biting people. And that's just for a million dollars. Forget the million dollars. We get to come into God's presence. Do you remember the God in Genesis 1 when there was nothing? And he said, light. And there was light. Let there be an earth. And there was an earth. Let there be stars in the sky. And there was Stars in the sky. Could you imagine that? And, and that same God who, who spoke the universe into existence, who spoke you and I into existence, who's the creator and sustainer of all things, King of kings, Lord of lords, above all things, holding all things together, we get to any time we want to come into His presence. Let's consider that a privilege. Uh, let's not take prayer lightly like it's something that we have to do. It, it's something we get to do. Prayer is a privilege. You know, the sad thing is, and I'm guilty of the same, is that many of us believe that we have more important things to do than talk to God. Did you hear me this morning? God of the universe, creator, sustainer, breathes stars out and they were above all the, the, he's so big we can't even begin to fathom it. And we believe we have something more important to do. Come on now. Come on. If the president called you this week and said, I'd like for you to clear your schedule, I'd like for you to come this week to Washington with me, spend the week at the White House, whether or not you agree with his policies or politics, I bet that you would clear your schedule to go to Washington. If you're not political, maybe, maybe you're... Favorite singer, your favorite sports star calls you and say, says, come, come this week, hang out with me in my mansion. I bet you'd clear your schedule, wouldn't you? I bet you'd have some time on your hands then. I, I, I bet that your business, your job, whatever's going on, I, I bet your kid's ball game, I bet they wouldn't be more important than that. I bet Netflix wouldn't be more important than that. I bet Facebook wouldn't be more important than that. I bet you'd clear out some space for that, and yet God of the universe has invited you to pray. Come ask me, and I'll answer you. Come ask, and I'll, I'll answer your prayers. Come talk to me, and I'll hear you from heaven. Come speak to me. It's an open invitation into my presence. Come any time. You won't wake me. Come talk to me. I have things for you. I want to show you things. I want to do things in your life. I want to do things in the lives of the people around you. But, but, but I need you to come into my presence. 
What a privilege He's given you and me to just get to come into His presence. And yet you and I, I'm the most guilty person here. We, we believe that, the, honestly, we believe that there's something more important than prayer. Could you think of a more important person to talk to? I, I know you're having troubles. I, I know you're busy. I know you have things to do. But I know a man who can take care of all those things. But you have to get into his presence. My prayer for us this year is that we would be people committed to prayer. Not just committed to prayer like an obligation, but that we would be a people who love to pray. That we would just love to be in God's presence. That, that we, we would say, do I really have to go to work, God? I, I don't want to sleep. I just want to be close to you. I, I just want to spend a little more time with you, God. We don't have to pray. We get to pray. We pray because we get to. It's a privilege to pray. It's not an obligation. It's not a duty. It's a privilege. Did you know that prayer is the difference between the best that we can do and the best God can do? I I don't know how your performance has been lately, but I figured out that I can't do much. Are you with me this morning? I, I do things and they just fall apart. I, I, I try to make things happen and, and it just kind of crumbles. But God can do more than I can do. If I go to God, He's able to do what I need to do. Prayer ought to be our first choice and not Our last resort. We pray because we get to, but we also pray because we need God. Did you know that this morning? You need God. He's the creator and sustainer of all things. There's nothing that you can do without God. If God does not allow you to take another breath, then you don't. If God does not allow the sun to, to rise in the morning than it doesn't. If God does not hold all things together, then it doesn't get held together. We need God. We need God way more than we'd like to admit. And we need God much more than we act like. We need to pray because we need God. Prayer is our declaration of dependence on God. It's saying, God, I can't, but you can. I can't, but you can, God. I I can't do this thing, but you can. I, I, I can't help my lost family member, but you can. I can't quit this thing on my own, but you can. You can help me, God. I can't heal this sickness. But you can. I can't do this thing. But you can. I can't grow this church. But you can. The the difference between the, the difference is made in prayer between what we can do and what God can do. We need God. And I believe, I heard this this week, and it so impacted me that the number one reason we don't pray is pride. We don't believe we need God. We believe that we can do it on our own. We believe we can accomplish it in our own effort. Our pride keeps us from praying. Our pride keeps us from falling on our face before God and saying, Be merciful to me. I need you. Pride keeps us from prayer. God, humble our hearts. May we humble ourselves before you in fasting before you have to humble us on your own. Did you know this morning it's better to humble yourself in fasting 
than, than for God to have to humble you. It'll happen either way. But it, it's better to just bring yourself low and, and bow before God and say, I, I need you, God, because he, He'll let you know that you need Him eventually. He, he's, he, he loves you too much to let you go your whole life without knowing you need Him. An absence of prayer in our life is evidence of pride in our lives. We're so blinded by pride that we can't see our need for God. We pray because we get to. We pray because we need Him. But we also pray because it works. Do you believe that prayer works this morning? <coughs> James 5.16 says... Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another. When was the last time you prayed for your brothers? The person sitting next to you, the person a few rows up. And pray for one another, another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. You may say, well, I'm not very righteous if you're in Christ, you are. You've become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so when you pray, heaven takes notice. When you pray, when you begin to cry out to God, His ears perk up and say, what can I do for my child? What is it that they need today? He already knows, but He's listening. When the... The, the cries of his children begin to come up to heaven, God takes notice. Heaven begins to move. Things in heaven begin to shift around when the prayer of a righteous person is spoken. Your prayers are effective. Your prayers, you may not see the effects of them immediately, but they're working. Things are happening in heaven when you pray. Don't give up. You may not see it today. You may not see it tomorrow. It may not be seen for four generations. But your prayers are heard in heaven. And they will move things. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Your prayer has power. Do you believe that, that when you pray things begin to happen? Do you believe that, that prayer can make the difference? If you do, let's do it. If you believe that, let's pray. Finally, we pray because we get to. We pray because we need Him. We pray because it works. And finally, we pray because God hears us. God hears you when you pray. 1 John 5, 13-15 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. This is our confidence that we know when we pray, God hears. God hears through the noise of the world, through the prayers of everyone else. God hears your prayer. God hears through the noise of creation, through the noise of everyone speaking, through all of the things that He's taken in at once, and He hears your voice. God hears you when you pray, and when you pray according to His will, you'll have what you ask. That's not my words. It's the book's. I don't have to hinge my reputation on God answering your prayers because God's already hinged His. He says, when my people ask things according to my will, I will answer. I will answer. I, I will do it. I will come to them 
when they need me. I'll show up for them when they cry out to me. I was thinking this week back to our first trip to Haiti and uh, some of you guys were there and some of you may remember this and some of you may not. I'm not even sure uh, how I remember this but we were in one of the airports and um, Troy Truett was there on that trip and um, he seen some guys in military fatigues and he went up to them and was talking to them and uh, one of those guys happened to be uh, if I remember correctly, the, the commander of all the U.S. forces in Haiti. And uh, he gave Troy a card, and he said, if you guys get in trouble, call me, and I can have troops on the ground in a matter of minutes. And uh, Troy told us about that, and it gave me a little bit of confidence knowing that I had a direct line to somebody who could really get some things done. You know what I'm saying? If things got really bad, I, I knew that somebody could get there to us. And I, I thought about that this morning and the confidence that it gave me, but how much more confidence should we have that we have a direct line to the God of the universe, commander over angel armies? That, that we don't have to wait on a helicopter to show up or a Humvee to show up, but... But God can have somebody there. He can have an angel there in less than a second. When you open your mouth to cry out to God, God moves. And God can have an angel army standing at your side in the moment you need it. That's good news this morning. It should give us some confidence that in the very moment that we pray, God is willing to answer. He stands ready to answer our prayers. He stands ready to hear our cries. He stands ready to deliver us from our troubles. He stands ready to deliver us from the hand of the enemy. He stands ready to save us.